One of my favorite games as a child and still, if I were honest, uh, to this day is uh, the old classic hide and seek. And I want to suggest to you that this, uh, this passage maybe can be best be approached by thinking of it as a different kind of twist on that game. It's about seeking and then being hidden. It's such an interesting uh, image that Paul is continuing with here. He's talking about uh, the death of the believer in Christ and the rising of the believer with Christ. And it's an interesting image and it kind of pulls us in a different direction than we often see. I want to focus on this image of you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are of earth, for you have died and your life, your life is hidden with Christ in God. You want to think about the hidden life. But first, this image of a, a new reality in you that happens by virtue of your baptism and your faith in Christ is really almost, a, it almost seems like an overpromise, right? An overpromise. How can this be? We, we see people of faith and by all intents and purposes, they seem just like everybody else. Do they really have some new thing, some new self being born? in them and emerging. And I want to think about that uh, just a bit because for one thing it's, it's kind of strange to hear the scriptures saying your life is hidden in Christ with God. We're told in other scriptures we're supposed to be talking about our faith and making everything clear and proclaiming and able to give our testimony. So what is it that is hidden? with Christ in God. Well, Paul is trying to give the believers an idea, an affirmation, that there is real spiritual energy that comes to believers as a result simply of their union with Christ. In baptism and in faith, we unite ourselves with Christ by God's gracious invitation. And in that union, somehow, there is new energy, energy from beyond us, that empowers us to be new, renewed people. Now, I, one of the things that I really find a privilege doing um, as, a, as, a, as a pastor, believe it or not, is uh, funerals. And one of the... I particularly, um, I particularly find it uh, meaningful, and fortunately, it most often is that I do funerals for people who have lived long lives. Um, and one of the things that I try to do, and, and actually that kind of just emerges for me is, as I uh, listen to the story of a person's life over time, um, I'm almost always, strangely reassured by those who have gone and participated in a worshiping community that the word of God has slowly made an impact on their life and has shaped their commitments and their priorities. And sometimes you can only see kind of an evolution when you get enough perspective and enough time process considered. So. Oftentimes, it does strike me when I do a funeral that, wow, even though I'm never confident that any one sermon is going to make a difference in what anybody thinks or believes, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I believe that hearing and considering week after week, maybe sometimes just sitting in the pew routinely, the words sink in. And they have a meaning and an energy all of their own that shapes a life more in the image as God intended us with Christ. 
And Paul is uh, saying that if we, if we, we have been united with Christ in baptism, and somehow if we consciously embrace that, we will be assured that this energy will transform us and be at work in us. Now, I tried to figure, I tried to think of some human analogy for this kind of energy that you don't see, that, you know, it, it, it's not like it takes over and controls you, but, but that it really does kind of empower your will and your spirit to be a better person. And for me, the best analogy I could think of was my ADHD medicine. <laughs> now, my ADHD medicine, uh, does not really change my personality fundamentally. Perhaps I might wish that there were a pill that would, but <laughs> that is not uh, to be. Uh, but what it does do is it helps me have a little bit more control over my focus and a little bit more uh, clarity to stay directed. Still a fight, but it empowers it and it really makes a difference. I do feel that I have my energy directed to, to things more productively when I have that help. Now, I do have to remember to take it, which uh, takes a little bit of intentionality and developing of new habits. And I do have to um, still work on disciplining my mind and remembering that I have to focus on being focused more than other people do. But it still is kind of a surge of energy. And I actually think when Paul is talking about set your mind on things above and not on earthly things, he is encouraging the church to think about being intentional in connecting and celebrating the union that Christ has already offered to us and made real so that we can live into that and enjoy its benefits in this life. So simply remembering and developing a habit of trying to invite Christ into your daily life, its struggles, its opportunities, its challenges, is an opportunity to celebrate the union that Christ has already offered for us that someday will be complete. When Christ comes, we'll see him as, we, as he is and we will be as we are meant to be also. In the meantime, between now and then, there's an aspect of life united with Christ in this world that has some hiddenness about it. I want you to think for a minute in terms of your relationship with God. What would you have the most difficulty explaining to someone else or kind of justifying in rational terms? And how does the way you think about your being united with Christ affect your daily choices. I thought of a couple things that really do seem to me to be kind of hidden in my life as I am hidden with God in Christ, or with Christ in God. There are some things that are hidden from others who um, are not people of faith, who have not been, been born into the image of being a child of God, made in God's image, when everyone else is also. And so there are ways that I look at other people and I see not just what is, but I see what could be and I want to invest in it. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever had anybody say to you, why are you wasting your time with that person? Why do you keep, you know, trying again? There's something about motives of love and compassion that's kind of hidden. Sometimes people just don't get it because they don't see what we imagine God sees 
on the other side. And it's a little bit hidden. And sometimes, sometimes people can shame you for it. Someday, I'll be revealed. There are some things about our motives that just fundamentally are hard to explain to other people about the way we think of others and maybe even the way we think about ourselves. There may be some things about our motivations that don't make sense of, of the discipline that we do. Why do you give money to the church? Why would you invest yourself in something that is so intangible and in the goods that it produces? Why would you invest money in building up faith in people? Well, we see what faith does. It flowers in all kinds of ways that you can't necessarily prove, well, that came from somebody's belief in my investment in the, the church and the proclamation of faith, but, but somehow we know. But there's a little bit that's hidden about that from the world. I think there are some things about a life that's hidden with Christ and God that are even hidden from those of us who do believe and, and who are really trying to live into our being united with Christ, trusting in it and leaning on it. Sometimes when we go through trials, what is hidden from us at any given point in time may be how that trial will be used to refine our character. When we go through suffering, sometimes what's hidden from us is how down the road it will have expanded our compassion. Sometimes what's hidden from us in our experience of um, disciplining ourselves are the ways in which we're inspiring and influencing others. Sometimes the seeds that we plant, the fruits of them, we never see. But by faith, we know they come. And so I think Paul is, is talking about that hidden life because he wants to encourage people to trust and believe and continue to lean into the real power that God gives us and is working through us by our being united with Christ. And it can be easy to give up on that. When you're not getting a lot of affirmation from people around you, when the world is not affirming patience and forgiveness and kindness, when uh, it seems stronger to use hard words and tough lines and when it seems not as powerful or significant. We are asked to trust in the patient work of God renewing us from within. Our lives are partially hidden right now in God, but someday God's truth, righteousness, love, and mercy will be fully revealed and shared with us. And in those times in which um, you're feeling a little bit doubtful and discouraged, there's another sense in which our lives can be hidden with Christ and God. You know that old hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? In the Old Testament, there are lots of images about hiding places as places where God is sheltering us. And that's the other sense in which sometimes our lives are hidden with Christ and God. Christ can simply be when no one else understands what is driving our motivations. Christ can be our resting place. Can hide us from the judgments and the misunderstanding of the world around us. No cause for boasting over anyone. 
but a real cause for rest and blessing. And on this account, Paul concludes this passage with, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Amen.